we will we will wait for a moment. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Randy Wagler, and I want to welcome you to Country Hills Church, whether you're here for the first time or whether you've been attending with us more frequently. And also, special welcome to those who are online with us this morning. At Country Hills Church, we are all about people helping people follow Jesus. And, you know, last week was Easter, wonderful service. You know, but the thing that we remember about Easter, I, rem I think about, is that as Jesus left, he gave the disciples that commandment to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's really what we're about, is being people, helping people follow Jesus. And if you want to get connected with us, we'd love to, to get, keep connected with you. You can connect with us on social media. You can fill out a Get Connected card. And uh, there's, so there's lots of ways. You can sign up for our weekly emails. Those are great ways both for families, a special family uh, newsletter, as well as a church newsletter to keep you connected and make sure you know what's happening in the life of our church. So just really want to welcome everybody this morning. You know, I was saying to somebody this morning that one of the favorite things that I like to do, and you can call me a little bit crazy, I guess, is I actually like business meetings. Who likes business meetings? Why do I like business meetings? Why do I like our annual business meeting that's coming up in two weeks on January 21st? You know why? Because it's not just business like business. I, be, I was involved in business for many years. This is about God's business. And it's about the work that we do here at Country Hills. It's a way for us to look back at how God has blessed and used Country Hills. And it's a way also to look forward to what we anticipate God will do in the, in the year ahead. So it really is... Uh, it's a good meeting to be involved with. Not, it's uh, not just for members. It's for everyone who wants to attend. You can attend in person or you can attend online. And that's at 6.30 on the 21st. So we're going to do some reports. And we're just going to really uh, share about how God's been at work in the life of Country Hills Church. Another thing that I'm really excited to, to look forward to is, uh, I mean, how many of you like the summer and going to the beach? Who likes going to the beach? Well, you know what? We're kind of not going, we're not really going to the beach, but we're going to kind of have the beach come to us, because this year our uh, daily vacation, our, our um, Bible camp uh, is going to be coming, and it's, you can see on there, it's scuba, and we are going to dive into friendship with God, so it's going to be a lot of fun, um, I'm excited about it, I'm going to be helping out, uh, and we're really excited, so what we need is, there's lot, the good news is there's lots of room for more, more to attend, so if you have already registered, that's great, we'd also like you to tell your friends um, you can uh, get a card. You can have a QR code to sign in. They can, they can register. We have lots of room. We really want this to be a special time for our children so that they can grow in their, in their faith. And you know what? The neat thing about um, a daily uh, or Bible camp is that it's really a way for kids to just maybe, wherever they're at, grow in their faith, find out about who, that God loves them, and it's a way for us to give back to our community. So one thing you can do, besides registering uh, as children, we want you to keep praying. We need to keep praying for that. So that's something we can all do, no matter whether we're involved or not, you can pray. And in coming up as well, if you want to volunteer, we still need some volunteers, you can, um, you can do that as well, and you can talk to uh, Jeremy or uh, uh, Chrissy about that for volunteering for SCUBA. So we're really excited about that. Uh, also, there's lots of other things that are ongoing at our church in the days and weeks ahead, and so you can take note of those on the screen. And uh, we're just really excited about what God's doing in the life of Country Hills, and uh, you can take advantage of those as they pertain to you. Just before we start our time of worship, let's stand together, and I'll open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to this place today. It's by no accident that we are here. You have brought us here today, and you want to speak into our lives. So we ask that as we worship you, as we hear your word, as we participate, that you might just help us to, just for a moment, put aside some of the, the things that are, that are heavy on our hearts, just for a moment, so that we might see you more clearly, so that we might worship you in spirit and truth, and just be able to experience again your love. And God, I pray for those who are coming in today, and maybe they're just uh, exploring faith. And God, I just thank you that they are here, and I pray that you would speak to them today. In everything that happens in this service, we ask that you would be honored and glorified. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.
voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other
Spirit, we continue to give ourselves to you. We continue to ask that you would help us continue to surrender, continue to worship, and that the outpouring of our lips and our hearts would be true and sweet to you. Amen. You may have a seat. for a baby dedication, you can see some slides up here for the Baverstocks. Well, today we rejoice with Richard and Tristan Baverstock, and you can see Theo is a pretty little smiley guy. You are, and uh, Theo's come into their heart and into their home. Parents are granted a sacred responsibility for the upbringing of their children. Parents uh, get the responsibility to be the main models of how to follow Jesus. Uh, children are greatly influenced by the character and example of their parents. Children have great value in the eyes of God. So children are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today, the leaders of tomorrow. Jesus welcomed and blessed children. He didn't hinder them. He didn't keep them away. He welcomed them in. In fact, he warned against causing children to sin and warned us as adults and teens and older kids for the younger ones below us that we live in a way that they might follow our example and we don't lead them into sin. In fact, he often used children to teach us about faith and the kingdom of God. So we welcome this little one today. Uh, the act of dedication does not uh, save Theo. We know that that's a decision for him to make later. But this is more a um, dedication of this whole home, this child to God, and an opportunity for these parents to rededicate their lives and commit themselves to raising Theo and Maverick and Nicole and Clark in uh, this home with Christ as the center. The name Theodore has some Greek roots, and it means gift from God, and so we rejoice with this family because he is indeed a gift from God, and we stand with them today in, I'll get to you in a minute, uh, we stand with them today and echo their hope that he would choose to follow Jesus, and we as a community, as a church family, agree as well to do whatever we can to help them raise Theo in a way that he might choose Jesus. So Richard and Tristan, today you're presenting Theo in dedication to God. This dedication of your child is an expression of your desire that he would follow Jesus. As parents, you're indicating your intent uh, and purpose to surround your child with every influence that will lead him to choose and follow Jesus. In dedicating your child, you acknowledge Theo to be a gift from God. His name reflects this. His nurture and spiritual welfare are your responsibility. It's proper today that you declare your purpose to lead him in the way of Jesus Christ by answering the following questions before our church family. Will you give an example of Christian life and instruct and guide Theo in Christian living through the use of the Bible, prayer, and as a result of the church and family life as the Lord helps you to do so? Will you seek to lead him to a personal acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord as God enables you to do so? And do you therefore solemnly agree to fulfill these promises so far as lies in your power? The Lord being your helper, if so, answer, we will by the help of God. All right, let's see how this goes. Hey, buddy. Hi. Hi, come on. Hi. Good morning. Well, Theo, God loves you very much, and he has a great plan for, those lights are bright. Let's get you out of there. He has a great plan for your life. He has planned you and given you to your parents, and so we dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and and the Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace. And we believe that raising children is part of a whole church family. So I'm going to invite all of you to stand up at home if you're watching. Stand up too. Church family, friends, congregation of Country Hills Church, do you agree to do whatever you can so far as lies in your power to help this family to raise Theo in a way that he might follow your example as well in choosing Jesus as you model the way of Jesus? If so, say we will by the help of God. Would you join me in prayer for this family and this home? Dear Jesus, thank you for Theo. Thank you for the blessing he is to to this family and to all of us. We thank you for him. We ask your blessing be upon him. We ask you to keep him safe. You would guide him. You'd lead him. He would soon find out what a wonderful gift he is, that he would discover his place in your plan, and that the choices he makes would keep him following you his whole life, and that we just stand excited, God, for all the great things you'll do in and through his life. May you bless Richard and Tristan and his siblings as they follow Jesus and model how to do so in this home. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Here. I got, I got a card. Thank you, Lord, for feeling safe and being able to be together, to pray in your name, to worship in your name, to sing your glory and to sing about your forgiveness and being able to have faith in you. Lord, we come to you. We declare our faith to you. We follow you, and then we forget and get temptation, and we go and sin. But we can always trust that you redeem us and you chase us. You chase us down and bring us back to the anchor, to the path of Christ that we can always trust in. We can trust that you wash our sins away and that we can have faith in you and we have hope in you. We can have hope that you can move a mountain. We can look at the evidence we have in the Old Testament. You divided the sea for Moses. You gave him strength. He told you, I can't even speak properly. I can't say anything. How can you choose me to lead? But God, you can make miracles. You can cleanse our sins and you can make leaders out of us. We can go out knowing that we can bring your light to other people's lives even if they live in darkness, you can help us to stop the sun so they can see the light. If they have spent too much in darkness, they can't see. You can open their eyes and their heart's eyes so they can see you and your light and faith that you can show them. We can trust you that when we fall down, you can pull us back up and show us that we can be strong in you, not because we are perfect, because you are, and the path we have followed is. And we always have an anchor when we get lost, when our life gets messy, when we get sick, when we get, get weak. We know that we have an anchor, and that is what helps us to be still and to be silent and listen to you. Your words and your promises give us hope that we can make things better because we have you with us, walking this journey with us and helping us be so strong that we can even share it with others. Every opportunity we get, you give us wisdom to speak your words when it's time. You give us wisdom to be quiet, completely silent, and act in your words so others can see you and feel and pray for others when we can't speak or act in your words. Thank you, Lord, for this faith you have given us and the trust you've given us in you. We pray that you help us keep the trust and remember where our anchor is and the center of our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, you can see that uh, kids are pretty important to us, and we're going to dismiss our kids grade 6 and under to children's programming There's a staff nursery, or if you'd like to 
be with your children in the nursery as a parent room and watch the service live stream, you can do that as well. And here's the part of the show where, well, it's not a show service, where the kids empty out. We'll see you in a bit, kids. Well, welcome. Thanks for being here this morning. Some of you may have come uh, online or in person first few times the past few weeks. That's wonderful. It's great to have you part of the Country Hills Church family. If you grew up in any type of church setting, maybe the way I dismiss the kids shows what era I raise my kids in because the uh, this is the part of the show where Larry comes out and sings a silly song was hard in my brain and I could not shake those words. So, Uh, We begin a series uh, this morning in the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua is 24 chapters long. We're not going to go through all 24 chapters. In fact, chapters 9 through 24, we're skipping. You can read those on your own because that is the rest of the conquest of the land. Over and over again, we see similar pieces, similar parts. So we're going to look at the origins here of Joshua and taking the land and what that that means. Focus on the beginnings, on the big story. Now, there's Uh, Something that tends to happen in uh, church when we're reading Bible narratives or in our devotional time, we do something really good, really important at at the exclusion of something else. So the thing we often do really well is we find ourselves in the narrative, in the main character. In the book of Joshua, it's, I mean, centered around. Okay, in case this was a difficult question for you, all right? The book of Joshua is centered around the life of? Very good. You're, you're already halfway there, right? And so we find ourselves in the life of Joshua. But sometimes when we do that, we miss that God is doing something bigger in and through the main character. And so we're going to focus on the big grand story of what God's doing in his plan of redemption all throughout Scripture. Because this piece of the story, of his big story, of his redemption plan, of his rescue of humanity It's actually really, really important. So my hopes for the series, you'd learn some more about Joshua, (laughs) absolutely, and you'd know more about the place of this, uh, his life and what happens in the lives of the Israelites in the narrative, in this piece of the big story. It's really important. I hope you'll find yourselves in that big story. I hope you find yourselves in Joshua. I also hope that you will learn what it means to be strong and courageous. So that's the theme of our series. I hope that you will learn to have faith, greater faith in God, as, as that uh, sermon video showed, that you would trust like never before. You'd have faith like never before. You'd learn the connection, the deep connection between our faithfulness and our obedience and our experience of God's blessing. So a couple, uh, couple um, you know, precursors, okay? Uh, when I talk about blessing, and prospering, okay? I'm not talking about prosperity gospel. I'm not talking about hashtag bless, like God really blessed me because I got a good parking spot, or look at the sale I got online. He must really love me, right? And uh, we think, you know, I mean, God can do that, but I think he's a little greater, a whole lot greater than that. So I'm not talking about, uh, you know, sheep and cattle and land and money and all these types of things, even though that's a piece and a part to the Old Testament narrative and how God interacts with his people during that season and era of life. It's deeper than that. God's promises and his blessings to us now as New Testament believers. And for those of you who are searching and seeking uh, what all this church and Christianity stuff is about, we have a deeply rooted story that comes throughout time and we're living now. So we're going to jump right into Joshua chapter 1. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. 
bring your devices or bring your Bibles, bring something to take notes on and stuff. Uh, you're not listening to my words, you're listening to God word, God's word. I hope I bring some insight to you. But what I find really helpful when I'm uh, listening to someone speak is to actually have it there. So if you're looking on the screen, on your screen there, you'll see the verses as they go by, but you won't be able to go back and, and say, oh, what did you say? How does this connect? What does this mean? You're not necessarily listening to God, taking your own uh, notes. And so that's a great way to listen. I don't want you to hear my words. I want you to hear God's word. And, and it's really helpful if you bring your own, own Bible. It's not, like we're not saying you have to. If you forget, we're not waiting at the door saying, well, like, what are you doing? I'm saying this is a healthy way to listen. I do the same thing. I would much prefer that I see everyone's heads buried down here and you're listening to God and I'm kind of this thing in the background because God's really speaking to your heart something personal. So Joshua chapter one. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, The Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north. From the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. So it sets up the whole narrative and plot of this personal promise to the Israelites and then some promises to Joshua as he remains faithful. A big part of the point here is that God has a purpose and a plan to fulfill his promises. So God has a purpose. Uh, purpose and a plan to fulfill his promises, promises he's given to uh, Adam and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. If you're not familiar with who they, they are, they come earlier in the biblical narrative. But he has a part for us to play and a plan or a path for us to walk um, to make it a reality. So what we're going to see throughout Joshua is that God is trying to fulfill his promises And he's trying to do that again and again. We find that before Joshua, we'll find that afterwards. And the way he does this is he's got a plan for us, and he calls us to obedience, and he's got a part for us to play. Everyone has a part, everyone. We still have that. He's still operating like that with us today, and he did it then. And the fulfillment of that plan, God doesn't doesn't just do it. He relies upon the obedience of his people and his goodness. So even in our disobedience, even in our fallenness, even in our weakness, he still sees his plans, but he waits and works in and through us. So what's the purpose of the book? Well, the purpose of the book of Joshua, where it's included in the Hebrew scriptures, which is our Old Testament, is that it would give the account of the people of God, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, coming into the promised land that was promised to the patriarchs. When we say patriarchs, it means like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it, it's an account of this. It comes in the Hebrew Bible at the beginning of the prophecy. So they consider Joshua to, to begin the section on, of the prophets. It comes same place for us, but we consider it as the first book of the books um, or uh, of history. It's, it's part of that Um, of the historical books. So sandwiched in there with all the different histories is Joshua. So who wrote this? Well, there's some debate between scholars, and some scholars feel that it was a compilation of a number of people a few hundred years later, 50, 100, 200, 300 years later, who took the verbal witness and the stories that were passed down generation or generation, put it all together, and then we have it. So some, some believe that. But I, I don't think that is the most plausible authorship. In fact, I think the most plausible authorship, and I'll tell you why in a moment, is Joshua himself, and then in and around his death, which comes in the very last chapter, chapter 24, obviously he's not writing about his own death and the things that happen afterwards, right? So there is some sort of compilation, and there may have been some assistance throughout, as they often had people who are scribing and working on it. But I would say that, there is a main author and some sort of contribution right at the end. Why do I say that? Well, when you look at the words of this book, it's an eyewitness account. There are words like us and we. Whoever did it, whoever wrote it, and it seems like Joshua, 
He's the most plausible, was there for this. There are also details about what happened that could only be known in that era. So if you look back uh, in archaeology and in history, you'll find that cities are built on cities are built on cities. And oftentimes in historical accounts, and sometimes in the Bible, they will say things like, this thing happened in this city, which is now called this city, or it happened at this rock, which we now call this. As peoples come in and move and migrate, as things happen and they rename things based on major events, the names and places and things that happen, they change. But in Joshua, they're correct for the era. And so it doesn't seem that if someone's making some stuff up or compiling things, they would write it from an eyewitness point of view or that they would put things in there um, about the era. There's another really big clue in Joshua 6, uh, 25. And Rahab, who will come uh, to in a few weeks, Rahab is said to have been alive at the time of this writing. So Rahab is still alive. So that's a pretty big clue. Either someone is authoring this and lying a whole lot about a lot of stuff, or it's accurate. And it seems like it's very accurate. It's the most plausible thing. In fact, I, I, sometimes with these things, I, I listen to my New Testament and Greek professor in Bible college, uh, Ray Dietz. And he would say, when you're encountering the Bible, um, if you have to reach around your head to touch your nose to make something fit, it's, pro- it's probably not the right thing. You're probably going about it in the right, wrong way. The most basic, the most plausible, the best way to read it is this way. And there are also two places in the book of Joshua where it says Joshua wrote this stuff down. He recorded it the- himself. Joshua took account of this piece and this piece. So it's most plausible. Dating of this, we don't know what date. Okay, there's, there's two main schools of thought on when Joshua was written and when these events took place. And they're based on backdating from certain dates, and you go back to see when the exodus would happen, and different people find different dates. Because you're saying, well, this period would have been this long, and this happened about this long. But there's other you know, good evidence for it being a little shorter, a little longer, doesn't matter. Don't worry about the when. Worry about the what. So here's the what. Here's the big picture. Uh, God called Moses to lead his people from slavery in Egypt out to a land of promised rest. Okay, that's what promised land talks about. It's a land of promised rest, away from the slavery, away from all this stuff. He brings them out miraculously. Moses leads them out. They're not too far out of slavery, and the people start to rebel. They go to Mount Sinai, and Moses takes this guy named Joshua with him up the mountain, and they receive the Ten Commandments and laws and all the stuff about the tabernacle. And while they're up there, the people rebel. They say, Moses isn't coming back. God isn't so good. Here we are in this desert. We have nothing to eat. It's terrible. And they build a golden calf, and they decide, we're going to follow this thing instead of God. Moses comes back down, and eventually, through all sorts of wandering and difficulty, they end up on the banks of the Jordan River, which keeps them, it's dividing them from where they are in the wilderness from the promised land, the land we know as Israel today. And along the way, they face all sorts of obstacles. And this guy named Joshua, we see him fir- <clears throat> excuse me, first in Exodus 17. He's chosen to lead God's people against the Amalekites. The Amalekites are, well, the Israelites are wandering. They're attacking them. They don't want them in there walking past. And, and so Moses calls Joshua, and Joshua leads them to victory. And it's clear from the text that it's not because uh, Joshua is a great military leader or, or anything like that. He's a great young man, and, and he's a great leader. But it's clear that God is working in him something he can't do himself. And we see this pattern again and again. Then in Exodus 24, he's up the mountain with Moses. And then finally in Numbers, he's on the shore of the Jordan River with Moses. And Moses says, I'm going to send 12 spies in. And he choose one person from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And guess who's chosen from Joshua's tribe? Joshua. Joshua and the 11 others go into this promised land. They find it's a land flowing with milk and honey, which is the exact terminology that God had used back before they even came out of Egypt. He said, there's this awesome land. It's this land I promised to Abraham. Abraham looked out on it and I I said to your forefather Abraham, I make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. 
And this is going to be a good place for you to live. This is where I'm going to bring you. And so they're standing on the, on the shore, and the spies go in, and after a time they come back, and ten of them say, there's giants in there. It's a great place. It's a wonderful place. There is no way we could take this. And two of them, Joshua and another guy named Caleb, say, yeah, they're correct. It's, it's pretty scary in there, but it's a great place. God's got this. If he's been with us this far, he can do even greater things. Let's go. And the people say, no way. And they want a new leader. They're done with this Moses guy. <laughs> They're like, let's get rid of Moses. Let's kill Caleb and Joshua. And let's get about our business. And so God judges them. And the people wander in the desert for 40 years. So when does Joshua take place? 40-ish, about 42, 43 years after the exodus out of Egypt. It's definitely 40 years after those spies come back. And the people reject God's plan. Everyone except for two people, Joshua and Caleb. And at the beginning of the book of Joshua, here's the setting. They're on the banks of the Jordan. The people are gathered. Everyone from the first generation is dead. Okay, 40 years wandering in the desert, that might do that to you. And they're all gone. And it's the next generation. And they're on the banks of Jordan. And Moses has died. And Moses has chosen this guy named Joshua, who's been his assistant for some time, to lead the people. In fact, Moses, under the direction of God, gives Joshua the same authority. And God says, the way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. And Moses is waiting, uh, sorry, Joshua is waiting to do the same thing he did 40 years ago. 40 years before he was ready to go. But now he's lived through 40 years of a stubborn-hearted people. God's weeded out all the people who have said no, including Moses, who did not say no, but caved to the, the will of the people. And so Joshua is afraid. Joshua, it, the, the way it seems is that he's wondering, I think in his heart, at least the context lends itself this way, that he's wondering, can I lead like Moses? I'm not Moses. So if, if the people rejected Moses, well, they reject me. Like, if they wouldn't follow him then, why, why would they follow me now? And so Joshua chapter 1, that's exactly where he's at. There's a few themes that we can find in this wonderful book. The promised land is the place where God's people will live in God's way and show the world God's blessing. That's the point of the promised land. They needed a place to be. So there's an illustration of God partnering with his people. God doesn't do it for them. He doesn't like say, okay, I, you wait. Okay, go to this place. I'm going to do it all for you. He also doesn't say, I'll wait for you. Go and do this thing. Go and do this thing. Prove yourself to me, and then I'll bring you in the promised land. He says, I work with you. Pattern throughout Scripture. There's an example of faithful obedience resulting in God's blessing and faithless disobedience resulting in wandering and trouble and confusion. We see that theme throughout Scripture as well. There is a foreshadowing of eternity and a throwback to the Garden of Eden. The throwback is this. The promised land is a uh, kind of a, a, a new Eden. It's supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be the place where God's people follow God in God's ways, and the world watches. And as they watch the Israelites live in this way that's different than all the other nations. Everything's different. The, their leadership, we just went through a sermon series in, in Easter about King Jesus and how the people rejected God as king. They were supposed to have God as king, not a human king. Everything about their culture, society, how they worshipped, who they were, how they treated everyone, their laws. Their laws were miles ahead of the, the people around them in their equity and kindness and generosity. And people were to watch this people of God like a beacon of hope and desire to follow him. This was to be the light of the world, this promised land. Yes, there's a land component to it, but it's just so that there's not this wandering. In fact, God didn't even want a temple. He wanted a tabernacle so they would learn that God is always with them. I'm not in one place but it's important you have a place to be a beacon. 
And so there's this promised rest. There's this throwback to the garden because God didn't do everything for them in the garden. He said, hey, I've got this thing for you to do. While we're in relationship, I want you to steward the earth. So this promised rest, I mean, the story of Joshua is not about conquest. There's lots of conquest. But it's not about conquest. It's about resting in God. It's about seeing God do in and through you what he has planned all along. But there's a foreshadowing to what Jesus would do in us and a foreshadowing to eternity because the promised land is supposed to echo that. It's supposed to point to that. In fact, um, the book of Hebrews talks quite a bit about this, that Jesus is, is a better priest and Jesus is a better sacrifice and there's lots in the New Testament that points back to Joshua and the Exodus and the promised land and says these are types. So that's, that's a theological word of a foreshadowing, a shadow of things to come. In fact, Joshua is the, uh, Jesus is the Greek form of the name Joshua. And there's lots of people, if you search on the internet, who said, we shouldn't say the name Jesus, and it's Yeshua, and all this stuff. I don't worry about that. It doesn't matter. It's who we follow and how we follow. It's not, God's not worried about our grammatical stuff. But Joshua, the Greek form of Joshua is Jesus. And so we see in Jesus a lot of what God does in Joshua. Joshua calls the people, leads the people, intercedes for the people, and Jesus calls us. He leads us, and he's ascended, and he's interceding on our behalf. So there's this theme that if God's people live in God's way, we'll experience God's blessing. It's such a wonderful book. We look forward to that day when Jesus returns. And he will make all things new, new heavens, new earth, and we'll have a better promised land. So in the way the promised land, you know, it, it, it was a throwback to Eden and it looks forward to eternity, we have, you know, one step better yet. Everything in Christ that we have now, we have a better sacrifice. We don't need a temple. We have all these gifts and blessings that God has, but it's not fully there yet. And so the promised land and, and Israelites and Joshua, it's, it's not fully formed, but it's, it's getting there. It's, there's an important place to understand in the whole narrative. So these are some of the themes we're going to encounter. Really important. So we want to find ourselves in the story on the ground, and we want to understand the, the story in the air, or the big story, what God's doing. It helps us frame what's happening now and look forward to Jesus' return. But we can't talk about Joshua without the elephant in the room. There are some difficulties in our modern understanding of Joshua. This nation comes into a different place and kicks the people out, completely destroys. They have holy war. So how does that work? How do we follow a God like that? Uh, what does that mean for today with same place, Israel, Gaza conflict? What does that mean for Jesus' return and all this stuff you might hear and read about Israel and end times? What does that all mean? You have to come back later. We'll talk about that, okay? We'll talk about that. So Joshua, his name means Yahweh saves, and found in his name is the whole plot of the whole, the whole narrative, the whole book. God saves his people. He loves his people. He has promises for his people, and as we obey him, we put ourselves in a place where we can receive the blessings he wants to give anyway. This sets the pattern we'll see again and again and again. So let's jump back into Joshua 1, back into the narrative. First few verses have set the scene. Here's Joshua. Be strong and courageous, verse 6. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Notice the big, large, all-encompassing words, okay? Uh, all the land, all the instructions, everything written, everywhere you go, God gives a big call, but he gives big promises, and he gives big support in behind Joshua, who clearly is feeling unqualified, feeling too weak, feeling like this is beyond what I can do, and he's right. 
God assures Joshua that God will be with him. Because the point of the promised land is that God will be their God and they will be his people. That's the plan all along. That's what we see throughout Scripture. That's what we have the blessing, those who choose to follow Jesus. Now, he is our God. We'll be his people. That's the promise of eternity where there's no more trouble, no more problems. All the problems we see in Joshua, all the victories, all the warnings, all that stuff, that is mirrored one day and we see some of it now. But there's something better to come. But there's instructions and there's reasons. Isn't God good? He gives instructions, but he's not like, here's instructions, do it. He knows we need something more. Sometimes we just need more. We, we just, we need more reason. Sometimes we need confirmation. And so God gives that. We'll just go through the four here in just these verses, okay? First one, first instruction, be strong and courageous. Why? Why? And he says, be strong and courageous in the beginning verses twice. He says it four or five times through this whole passage. Be strong and courageous. I'm going to use my hands. My kids, I drive them nuts because I use my hands, but I'm going to use my hands because I'm going to reverse it in a minute, all right? Be strong and courageous. Why? Because you're chosen to lead. Okay, first instruction, first reason. Second instruction, obey the instructions from Moses. So the verbal things Moses told you as his assistant. Why? Because then you'll succeed. Third instruction, study and meditate on the book of instructions. So they didn't just get 10 commandments on tablets of stone. Moses wrote them down. They became the law of Moses. Here's the way you're to live. And God says, study, meditate, memorize this book of instructions. Why? Because then you'll prosper and you'll succeed. It will go well with you. Finally, be strong and courageous again, but he adds, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. These instructions are clear, and there's clear results, but there's strings attached. Sometimes we have problems with that. God gives instructions. He gives results. His promises have strings attached. What I mean by that is, if we are going to receive and experience his promises, the things he absolutely wants to give us, we have to get ourselves in a place where we're ready to receive those. God isn't going to give us just what we want. He doesn't just get in behind our plans, and he doesn't just say, hey, do whatever you want. It's all good. Here's my blessings. What a mess that would be. If we did everything our way, and God still got behind them and blessed and prospered every one of our plans, man, the world would be even worse even worse. So there are strings attached, but there's a cause and effect to these instructions and reasons because we can reverse engineer them. How many of you are engineers? Engineers, okay. So you reverse engineer something. It means you look at the final product and you work it backwards to how it works and you work it out. We're going to reverse engineer these instructions and these results. So if we start with the results, we find Joshua, you are chosen to lead, first result. So, what does that mean for you? Reverse engineer. So you can be strong and courageous. I've chosen you. I'm with you. You can be strong and courageous. Second one, you'll succeed. Why? How? Because you have these instructions Moses gave you. They they point you in a good direction. Okay? You're going to prosper. Why? Because you're going to meditate, memorize the instructions. You'll have them by heart. They're in here. You, you, you're going to know right away what to do. That's character. Character is changing our default responses to the way God would have us respond. And finally, God is with you no matter where you go. Everywhere you step, God's going to help you. What, is that, what does that do for you? Well, it's because you need not fear. You need not be discouraged because you can be strong and courageous. So we can reverse engineer these. We can't expect to do things our way and for God to get behind them or to do what we want and to find God faithful to my plans. That's just not the way it works, and we don't see that here. That's what happened a generation earlier, 40 years earlier. They wanted God to get behind what they wanted when they wanted. God, rescue us from the, from the Egyptians. Give us manna. Give us food. Give us meat. Get us out of this desert. Give us a king. Do these things, and God time and time again says, no, no, that's not what you want. But you know what? I'm going to give it to you, and you're going to learn how it's going to work out in order that they might come back to his ways, God's ways and God's time with God's people shows the world God's blessing and God's promises. 
Verse 10, Joshua wastes no time. So he gets this word from God, and he goes right away and tells the people. Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell all the people, get their provisions ready. In three days, you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord God is giving you. He wastes no time. Here's my question for you. How willing are you to obey, okay, this quickly, this visibly? When you hear from God and he says, do this, whether you're reading it in his word or it's a word from the Lord, hearing God's voice, if you're not sure how to do that, we can go back to follow. We have a whole sermon series on beginning to recognize, hear, and follow God's voice. And Joshua wastes no time. He's like, all right, let's go. Send the officers through the camp. Tell everyone to get their gear ready. We're going in in three days. How willing are you to obey God, okay, that quickly and that visibly? That's a good question. I'm going to ask you a few more this morning. Verse 12, then Joshua called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. He told them, remember what Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord God is giving you a place of rest. He has given you this land. Your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land Moses signed. So these two tribes and half-tribe, they're not going to cross over the Jordan River to live. They're going to live on the east side of the Jordan River. But there's some specific instructions for them. Because they could have just went, no. <laughs> Not our problem. Like, you guys got to live over there. We got our promise already. Have fun. It's not the way it works. Your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land Moses assigned to you on the east of the Jordan River, but your strong warriors, fully armed, must lead the other tribes across the Jordan. Isn't that interesting? People not even, it doesn't even have anything to do with them whatsoever. Sometimes God calls you to do something, and it's not personally beneficial. It's beneficial for the kingdom. It's beneficial for others. We see that pattern here already. They will lead the other tribes across the Jordan to help them conquer their territory. Stay with them until the Lord gives them rest. You say, two. Gives them rest, too. And he has given you, as he has given you rest, and until they, too, possess the land the Lord God is giving them. Only then may you return and settle here on the east side of the Jordan River, in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, assigned you. Listen, God called different people to different parts of his plan because of their different gifting. The way God works is this. Joshua was not more important than the mother who stayed back on the east side of the Jordan River with her child. Okay? The warrior is not more important than the worshiper. We'll see that later. Everyone has a part to play. And if we only look at the book of Joshua through the lens of how can I be Joshua? Not all of us are leaders. Not all of us will be called to lead people. We all have people we lead by our example. But we all have a part to play. So my question to you is this. How willing are you to discover and play your part in God's plan? How willing are you to discover okay, your part to play in God's plan? We all have a gifting. We all have calling. Here in this church family, here in the kingdom. If you're not serving, if you're not mobilized, if you're not moving, if you're kind of looking internally and only worried about yourself, you're missing out. God wants to do things and he requires all of us to do together. And if we're not all pulling in the same direction, doing, working together as a body and as a family, there's, there's less that he's going to fully accomplish. And this is the way God works. And he moves with everyone. And then finally, 16 to 18. They answered Joshua. This is what the people say back to Joshua. This is very different than what happened 40 years ago before this. They answered Joshua, we will do whatever you command us, and we will go wherever you send us. We will obey just as we obeyed Moses, and may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey the words and everything you command will be put to death. So be strong and courageous. They hear the message that Joshua is saying, and they say, yeah, let's all be strong and courageous together. In fact, anyone who doesn't listen, we're going to put them to death. We need the next generation to be the brave ones to step out. The last generation, they all died. Okay, So there is an important part of generations in church family. Often the older generation has a wisdom to hold the younger generation back on foolish endeavors. That's one principle. But there are times where the older generation who says, no, we've tried that before, that's not the way it works, you can't do that. God's saying, God, sit back, raise up, encourage. We need next generation's leaders in country hills. We need younger people, whatever you mean by that. I think I'm younger people. I'm not younger people anymore. Okay? 
The fact I need to get physiotherapy for basic things, <laughs> right? Tells me I'm not a young leader anymore. We need more and more young leaders to say, whatever God says, I will do. Be raised up, assistance to be mentored and set loose to set us out on paths we're too afraid to take now. Ways to be together, people to reach. We're not there yet. And we never arrive, but we need a younger generation to show us how to be strong and courageous. We need kids. That's why we dedicate. That's why we do kids ministry. They show us the way. So younger people, whatever that means, step up. We invite you. I invite you. We need you. We want you. We want to see you fail. We want to see you grow. We want to see you try things. We want to get behind you. We want to cheerlead you. We want to lead you up mountains. We want to teach you the, the ways to conquer. We want to teach you how to be humble, how to listen, how to say, I think God told me this, but I'm holding it open-handed because I'm not sure in humility. And we all follow together. Everyone has a part to play. So how do we be strong? Why did I call the first message in a strong and courageous series, When I Am Weak? Because that's where Joshua is. This isn't, this isn't a formula for how to you know, find strength and work up courage and do great things for God and this thing standing in front of me when I'm ready to turn into the front parking space. I claim authority over that person in that parking spot so they'll come out because I need to get into Costco. Hallelujah. That is not, that is not what Joshua is about. We are weak. God knew what Joshua needed. So what did he give him? God gave Joshua his word. So the written instructions that Moses was given from God, written down, God's word, and he gave him God's words. So God met him on, that's where verse six starts. Joshua's on the shore and he's listening to God and God tells him, I know what you need. Be strong. Be courageous. If you do, here's what will happen. Listen to Moses' instruction. Read and meditate on the book of the law. Don't be discouraged or afraid. I, I want you to succeed. I want you to prosper. I want you to enter rest. I will be with you wherever your footsteps. That's exactly the words from God that Joshua needed. The point is this. Listen to God's word and words and live in God's way. Listen to God's word. So you got to know his word. Listen to his words. You need to learn to listen to him so you can live in his way. The story of redemption, the story of Jesus, what Jesus is doing in us is that we as God's people, those who choose to follow Jesus, and if you haven't, it's so good. We're meant to be beacons, cities on a hill. The promised land is meant to, was meant to be a beacon of hope that others would see you shouldn't sacrifice your children to gods. It's not good. It's evil. And they would see these Israelites who don't do that. And the Molochites and the Fer um, Philistines and Amalekites and Hittites and all these otherites outside would see how good it is to follow God. We're doing the same thing today. We're doing the same thing today. And when I am weak, that's when he is strong. Paul echoes that, 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, what I'm up against, what I'm called to do, what's coming against me, whether it's a physical thing we don't know or a spiritual thing we don't know, it doesn't matter. This thing I'm up against in my calling, I can't do on my own. And he said, God's with me. It's when I'm weak, I realize God is strong. Be strong and courageous. You don't muster it up for yourself and do it for God. You go to God and receive what you need so he works in you to work through you. Different person. Paul and Joshua, same God, different part of the plan, same way he works in and through them. It's the same big story. It's a, it's a big story. We all have a part to play. All of us are as valuable as Moses, Joshua, Paul. Our names won't be written in Scripture, but our names are written on God's heart. He knows you. He knows you need his word. You need his words because he wants you to live in the blessing of his way. What does this matter for us as we close this morning? You may not be standing on the banks of a Jordan River where you don't totally know what's ahead. Now, Joshua had an idea. He'd been there. He knew what he was facing, sort of, at least 40 years ago. You are standing against an unknown future. 
And some of you have very real needs and worries right now today where you're saying, if this doesn't change or if this happens, I don't know what I'm going to do. So you're not standing on the banks of Jordan, but you are looking at an unknown future. You may not have 40 years of wandering, but you certainly can look back on discouragement and disobedience, on times of disappointment where you're unsure and you're you're not sure what's going to happen. You're not an Israelite longing for a promised land, but you are a person longing for the good things God wants to bless you with. I'm not talking about an ease of life. The reality of this is mirrored all throughout Scripture. We see it in Psalm 23. In the presence of my enemies, you set a table. God doesn't promise to remove obstacles, and we'll see that throughout the book of Joshua. He doesn't just remove obstacles, but he promises to walk with us through the troubles and the trial till the day Jesus returns, and there'll be no need to remove because he's done it for us already. So, here you stand today. What will you do? Will you allow the fear of what lies ahead to cripple you, keep you still, keep you wounded, defeated, continuing to hold on to habitual sin and all these types of things? Or will you walk forward in courage and strength of God, learning his word, listening to his words, and doing your best to obey him and live in God's ways? Will you look back at the, the years behind you and allow the, the patterns of defeat and discouragement, disappointment, disobedience to shape your next step? Joshua could have done that. He'd been there before. He'd already been there. And the people turned on Moses. And he could have just said, no, no thank you. I, I can't go through this. I'm willing to guess he was pretty pleasantly surprised at this next generation who said, Whatever you say, we know God's with you. Whatever God says, we'll do. In fact, we'll oppose those. If there's people who say, no, we can't go, we're done with them. What will you do today as you stand looking ahead and as you look behind? Realizing that the promises God has for you, the way he wants you to live in his presence, the victory, the fruit, all these promises, it's not, it's not a promise for a, a good life and a life without trouble. It's a promise for a, an abundant, full, and eternal life. It comes at a cost, and it comes with a condition. Obedience. You can't expect to receive God's blessing if you don't live in God's way. So if the things in your life you know aren't lining up, and you're like, yeah, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> because it keeps you from Listening to God, it keeps you from walking with him the way he wants. He loves you. He wants this promised rest. He wants you to have a life of rest. Doesn't mean a life of ease. Doesn't mean you don't do anything. He saves us by his grace, which received through our faith, because he's got stuff for us to do. He's got stuff for us to do. Everyone has a part to play. We're all equal. But that part to play is in his strength, in his rest, bearing fruit through our lives because we're connected to him as the vine. And that's, that's grace. That's the way he works. That's, that's the narrative of Joshua and how sometimes they do that and sometimes they don't. <laughs> and when they do, they receive blessing. They experience it. And when they don't, they wander and they're confused and they have to be drawn back to God. Better to stand on the banks of the Jordan and trust God with his strength, with his courage, with his word, and with his words, so that we can move from weakness to strength, move from fear to courage, move from failure to success, and move from worrying to prospering. Would you stand with me? God, we pray that we would listen to your word, that we would listen to your words, that we would live in your ways. Lord God, that we would see in Joshua some of us, that we would see in what he does through, uh, what you do through uh, the people there, um, the bigger, grander story. Thank you for the opportunity, especially week after Easter, uh, to be in this wonderful plan of salvation through Jesus, who's a better high priest, a better sacrifice, a better leader. Father, I pray for those who are discouraged, for those who have significant things ahead of them, who are worried and defeated, feeling alone. May they hear your voice today. Know that you are with them. May we learn your word. May we trust you. 
And may we see that we live in strong and courageous ways, not because we've mustered some sort of superhuman strength and to overcome in our own strength, but because in our weakness we see you do in and through us what we could never do. And in that we would learn to rest while we accomplish your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here this week. Hope you'll join us next week. If you could stack the chairs, that'd be wonderful. Lord bless you as you go.